So without further ado, Brian Steiner. Uh, yeah, please. So it's a lovely shot of me. It's nice to see some keepers. I'm wearing my anti-keepa today. This is, uh, I kept it on just to make that joke. Uh, hi. So uh, the date is December 20th, 2015. And uh, my wife is very, very pregnant. Uh, and we're planning a home birth. And it should happen any moment now. And I look at my wife and I see that the doubt and the fear. It's actually our second home birth and our third child, but uh, there's some doubt and fear I see sitting with her. So we sit down together on the night of December 20th and I say to her, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be the most beautiful experience. It's gonna start a whole new chapter. It's gonna be a beautiful birth and everything's gonna be wonderful and don't worry about it and let it go and let it happen. So the next day on December 21st, 2015, we did indeed have the most beautiful home birth you can imagine into a pool of water with a fire going, with the outside looking in and the night and all of the stars. It was, it was a spectacular experience. One year later on December 20th, 2016, finds us in the airport. My mother had just been put into a hospice. And we get to the ticket and counter at the airport to check on and onto the airplane. And I left my wife's expired passport at home. Who knows why her expired passport is important? It has her American visa in it. And I'm standing at the counter and I forgot her visa to the US. So we send her mom and her sister, who uh, luckily are at our house, to go searching through the house for this expired passport. And they do find it. And they're on their way to the airport. And in the meantime, there's the Rosh Mishmeret standing next to us who's telling us, I don't think you're gonna make the plane. I think I'm gonna to have to close the ticketing and you're not gonna be able to get on the plane. So I took her aside and I said, this is what's going on and there's no chance we're not getting on this plane. We were the last people on the plane, of course. We made it on the plane, we made it to Florida. At about 8 p.m., I made it to my mother's hospice and sat by her side. They let me sit with her alone for a little while. I told her mom, she wasn't conscious. I said, it's going to be okay. Everybody's going to love you. No one's ever going to stop loving you. You need to let go. You're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. And what you need to do, you can do. At about 8.30 p.m., the nurse came in and pronounced her gone. That was exactly one year after the birth of my daughter on December 21st, 2016. Hi, I'm Brian Steiner. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, uh, this is a, an album that I've made with about uh, 30 friends of mine. I thought maybe I would get around to talking about it a little bit, but I probably won't, so I just, I just uh, put the picture up so we can admire it together. <laughs> so, I have three young daughters. Oh, well, I should talk a little bit about you guys want to know a little bit more about me. So, besides my mom dying and uh, <laughs> claim to fame. And album, I, uh, I host a radio show uh, that's in flux right now. I'm a producer of events. Uh, currently, I'm working on uh, a project with, uh, with the Parent Circle Forum, if you're familiar with them. They've all lost a nuclear family member in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, what we like to, like to call, and they have a group that says, we don't want you to, to be a member of our group. The very powerful stuff, very uh, strong group of people. Um, so I'm, I'm in the entertainment world, uh, musical production, sometimes musician, uh, mostly pro producer, promoter, uh, radio host, and things like that. You good there? Am I, uh, you good there? Every, everything's okay? Okay, so now I'll continue. So I have uh, three young daughters. My oldest is uh, at the time that my mom died, my oldest is uh, right around seven. Now, in my house, for death, I, I don't like to use the term death. It, it's, a meaningless, it's a meaningless term, especially for children. So in my house, it's called the, the body stops working. That's, that's what we know about death. The body stops working. That's the way we talk about it. I say, this person's body stopped working, that person's body stopped working. But now we have to come to terms with what that means, and I have to face my almost seven-year-old daughter who has a very close relationship with my mother. 
She's one of 10 grandchildren that she's the only one that ever got my mother into a swimming pool. So that's, uh, that they're very, very tight. And they, they have been, you know, I, I would say for a long time, but she's seven years old. So, you know, a long time for her. So, uh, so I have to talk to her about what, you know, what this, what this kind of means. So this is, this is the metaphor that I, that I used that she didn't really understand, but I, but I hope that one day she will. I said, let's say you have a balloon. Okay, and that balloon is filled up with air, and the balloon pops. What happens to the air in the balloon? Okay, there's a few things we could say about the air in the balloon. The first thing is the air in the balloon will never be a balloon again. There's nothing in the world forever and forever and forever that will ever bring this air back into a balloon. Any particle of air is one in a trillion chance. The whole thing is impossible. So the air in this balloon will never be together as the air in a balloon ever for the rest of the future of the whole universe, okay? On the other hand, the air has nowhere to go. The air can't not exist. Nothing about the air can suddenly vanish and, and make the universe a different place. Us, the universe being was it what it is, the air, the air has to always exist. So this is the the metaphor that I gave to my daughter that, you know, for a seven-year-old, it's maybe a little bit tough, but uh, obviously wasn't the only conversation we have, but it's the metaphor that I want to use for this conversation of, about death today. You good? Okay, I just like checking around. Everybody's playing. Everybody's playing around me. And I do think, by the way, that we need to acknowledge that we're talking about death in a former leper colony. I think this is very important to stay at one time to do honor to a, a lot of frickin' people died here and, and, and probably suffered here, at least they were together. So, uh, you know, this is, uh, th this, this hopefully will come back around to this point about w what is death and, and how, how, what is death from our perspective, okay? There's death, there's what it actually is. And, and we could talk about what death actually is, but really all we have is our, our perspective of death. Okay, so if we take this balloon metaphor, and I want to take beliefs out. I don't want to say that the air in the balloon is somebody's soul, is anything having to do with anything we don't know physically. Okay, that's a different, that's a different thing. Okay? The, the air in the balloon I want to take is actual physical things, the air that we breathe, the electromagnetic field that we are, all of these things, these are the things that we lose when we die. Okay, it's the physicalness, the physicality, everything that runs us. These are the things that we lose when we die. And more than that, we lose our, kind of like our inner world. Okay, but, but, but we got to explore what's really going on here. We have to understand it. We have to understand it a little bit deeper. So, I want to talk about our, how, we, how we identify ourselves. Okay, now... It always bothers me when people come up, you know, people want to convince you to do something, like eat according to your blood type or something like that, or they talk about something that, that they want to do, and they say, well, the ancient civilizations did this. You know, everyone uses that, right? They've been doing it for thousands of years. And so I say to them, yeah, you mean the people that sacrificed their children so the sun would come out, so they did it, so it's good enough for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't really make, make a lot of sense that we talk about being modern, being more compassionate, being more like this and being more like that, but yet what we reference to say that we're right is people that really didn't, didn't believe that way at all, at least from our perspective. But in this, I'm going to bring them up. Because <laughs> there's, there's one thing, we have this vision, okay? There are these villages and communities of people that are sacrificing for the greater good, literally sacrificing lives for the greater good. And, and in our culture, the way we think about it, the way we portray it, it's always against somebody's will. And even if it's with their will, then a savior comes in at the last second, shows this person their individuality, makes them not want to sacrifice for the greater good, and takes them away. That's our image. It can't be a comfortable thing for a person to give himself to the community, okay? His life, or whatever it is, because we're very individualized. In my mind, it wasn't like that at all. In my mind, women stayed virgins so they could be the one that was picked to be sacrificed. Families petitioned to say, choose someone in my family. 
it was probably a great honor. If you, someone, if you were chosen, if someone in your family is chosen to be the sacrifice to save the village, I, don't, I, can't, I can't imagine that there was a greater honor at that time than giving yourself to the community. So now when we talk about dying, the things that we talk about losing, okay, what are some of the things you think you're going to lose when you die? By a show of hands. Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Something that's not brought up, but... Awareness. Your awareness, your consciousness, your memories, okay? What are these things to us? What are these things to us? They're what make you an individual. They're your individuality. They're your self-definition. What goes with you when you die is the way you define yourself, okay? If you read my bio, I stay away from defining myself, right? I was a mathematician for seven years. I studied math for seven years. I left, I became a shepherd. I left that, I went into music, okay? I'm still leaving things all the time, okay? Because I don't have a strong self-definition and because that is a shield in a way. Because once you have a strong self-definition, you have something to lose. If you're a painter, you're afraid to lose your hand. You don't give a shit about your ear. Whoosht, doesn't matter. <laughs> but you're afraid to lose your hand, okay? If you're a singer, it's the opposite, okay? What you define yourself as, what you hold, and how you think about yourself, that's what's giving you this fear of, this fear of death, this fear of change, okay? Your personality, it's like money, okay? It was made up, you made it up, and other people made it up. They put it on you, and then you come to a time and you say, this is just the way I am, right? You've limited your ability to adapt, adjust, adjust, and change because you've defined yourself, you've allowed yourself to be defined, and you hold on to that definition, and you're afraid to let it go, okay? And now let's go to awareness, hopes and dreams, memories. This is all your definition, okay? You collect, you are right now in the present moment, the sum of the things that happened to you and the way you reconcile your past, as well as what you think you're going to do in the future, that you take that into yourself now, because it doesn't exist in the future. It exists now for you. It's, it's a self-definition of who you are. And to give that up when you die, that's very difficult. And now, if we go back to the tribal community or a village, when a person is connected to the environment around him, okay, his dreams are, are the dreams of the village. His memories are the memories of the village. The dreams village are the dreams of the individual. Everybody wants the same thing. There's no chance in my death that my hopes and dreams are going to die with me, that my memories will die with me. Nothing's, gonna, nothing's really going to be different for me except the physical shell, okay? That belief system is a much different structure for death and dying and for fear of death and fear of dying than what we have today where they make us individuals, where the individual is king, where you need to express yourself, okay? If you believe in free will, it's a lie, but go ahead and believe in it, it's fine. But, but these hopes and dreams are yours and yours alone. What happens when you die? I want to be a great author, I want everybody to read my book. Now I'm afraid, I'm afraid that might not happen, okay? But if, but if I want to write a book with 10 people, we all have the same goal in mind, the same dream, and this isn't even a village, this is 10 people, that fear will be, will be less and less, okay? So what we're talking about when we talk about death, let's go back to the air for a minute. What happens to the air from the balloon is it joins the collective of air. It joins the collective of air that we're all breathing from right now, that we're all taking from all the time. That's what happened to the air. Death is the merging of the individual into the collective, okay, in a very real way. Everything about us gets merged in, into the collective, whether it's our physical body going into the ground, whether it's our energy going into the air around us, our last breath. We merge into the collective, whatever, the, whatever you see the collective as, okay? My mom, if I take her, if I think about she was 100% herself, okay? I have two brothers. Each of us are 50% my mom, in a very real way, okay? That's 150% of my mom and one generation from my mom, okay? We have 10 kids between us. Each of them are 25% my mom. That's 250% my mom in the second generation after her. 
each of their kids will be 12 and a half percent my mom and I'll let the percentages and numbers run out themselves that's emerging in, into the in, into the collective in, into the collective that's that's one real way and I know that we think of these things as abstract we think of we think of this whole death thing as, a, as an abstract kind of thing in a very real way we're merged into the collective and this is what happened to my mom and this is what will happen to all of us one day so the more you can see yourself as a collective and not as an individual actually the more you could go backwards in that one and not forward is the less you'll be afraid in life of change of adapt adaptation of things happening to you and of dying because they're all the same it said that there's only one fear in the world and that's the fear of death I'm still working out how being afraid to pee in public is related to fear of dying but I assure you that it is every fear comes down to some thing that you've defined about yourself that you're afraid to change and and when you can let these things go when you can when it doesn't matter what you are if you're a high-tech low-tech a musician what an author or whatever it is you are if you can let that stuff go and not define yourself through these things death will change its meaning for you was that 20 minutes because I mean I, I could keep going thank you I've, see, I've, I've, when, I, when, I, when I wrote this talk and, and started doing it, so I mean, it came out to like 40 minutes every time I, I did it, and so I, was, I had to be sure to like leave a bunch out and, and get to the core. So, so we good. You want, you want to hear? So let me play something from the CD. Let me, actually, let me actually play something from the CD. You know what I like? You know how she came up in the beginning? By the way, you know why jellyfish don't die? Anyone know why jellyfish don't die? This is a good prize one. Yeah. She wants to give out prizes. I have CDs. She wants to give them out to you guys. Anyone know why a jellyfish doesn't die? Because a jellyfish... You, you have an answer? A jellyfish is not an individual. A jellyfish is a colony. It, it's not one creature. It's the truth. It's not one creature. It's, it's, it's a whole bunch of creatures living together as one thing. And so it can't die because if one part of it dies, it gets replaced. It can't die. That's why a jellyfish doesn't die and that's similar to what we're trying to say here today led yourself into the collective this is why you're in a community here the creative community so this is this is why I chose this theme of uh, of the community do you know do the epilogue no the epilogue exact amundo And so it ends where it begins, which is to say it really went nowhere at all. But this is the way with all things, is it not? Ashes to ashes and dust to dust being just about the only truth that exists. Oh sure, you can say cast your bread upon the waters, or love your neighbor as you love yourself, or what comes around goes around, or any other way you want to say it. Ultimately, the same thing is being said, is it not? The ending is the beginning, as it is with all things. It's just the part in the middle that holds our attention. From the moment it begins, the ending is assured. The journey of 10,000 miles is the first step, and your neighbor is yourself. We just like to see that part in the middle, that space between ourselves, creating and created by the time it takes to close the gap. Did you get, did you, you could stop it now. That's, that, now this is the song after the end. I'm not gonna, it's a bit long of a, of a song. Geva Lun sings it, I don't know if anybody knows Geva Lun. There's really good musicians on this album, by the way. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. So, uh, just briefly, this is, this is the, the album, you saw the album cover with the earth blown up and actually the original picture also had the sun like evilly scorching the earth, but I left that part out. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was hand drawn at first, you should see my sketch because I'm really not an artist uh, in that way. But uh, I'll go through a little bit because, because she tells me that uh, I got uh, a few, and, and I don't know if you can see, can, any, can you see in the back there kind of what's written here? This is a song that I wrote in two parts, okay? I even wrote it like this in two columns. This is, this is just the way it came out. And, and the first half of it is like a, a full life's journey. 
And, and the second of it, half of it is like the path to get on kind of on that life journey. Uh, and it's called After the End with a small T. I don't know why there's a big T here because we had big debates whether that should be a big T or a small T. You could think about why uh, on your own. But a few things I'll point out before we turn this over to questions about this particular song. And the, I'll go through a little bit about the life path, okay? And, and a few key words. After the end, when time begins, okay? When time begins, you're all with it there. There you'll wake up from the land of the living, okay? So this is saying when the clock is ticking, you're not really alive, okay? So let's start there. This is the way a life starts, the life that you know that you're living now, okay? Now, after the answers where the questions begin, there you'll start living outside of your dreams. Uh, uh, some of you have kids? So, so uh, you know what I, I you know I said I, I like when you like raise your hand up front like because it doesn't mean I have a kids or not and nobody know and anyone here ever have sex with an elephant you see it <laughs> it's like meaningless I just wave my hand here like anyone anyone doesn't doesn't mean anything um, it's good that none of you have raised your hands but a dog no I'm kidding um, so what what happens when a kid starts living outside of their own I'm hungry I'm tired they start asking what question why why. Why, why is that like that? Why do I need to do this? Why? When you start living outside of, your, outside of your own inner reality, you start asking the questions. Once you start living those questions, okay, you're on a life path now. Each life path you pick, whatever you're doing with your life, it's because you have a question. If you don't have a question, you're not living that life path. If you know where that road goes, you're not taking it, unless it's to your grandma's house and there's some pie. But you know what I mean, okay? Each life path you can choose is a question that you have, and you can use that backwards in your life, too. You can examine your life path and ask yourself what question you're asking. You can do that. Trust me on that one. Okay? Once the things you know can't be understood, okay, you've, you've gotten to the, the real essence. You're starting to get to the real essence of things. When, when you can no longer s express your truth, because none of us really can, we, we speak... When you have a conversation with somebody, I can ignore everything about somebody's personality because I recognize immediately the first thing I know in life is that anyway, it's made up, okay? I've had beers with skinheads in Greece on the streets with no problem at all because the per the, everything is made up. There's an essence and there's the made up part. You have to be able to separate those in life. So when you get beyond what can be understood, when you're expressing that in your life, that's when you're touching what, what we call love, okay? And then there's the promise at the end. There's always the promise, right? There you'll see peace in Noah's rainbow. I know in the back you can't see the bottom. It says, after a life well worth living, there you'll see peace in Noah's rainbow. This is the end of a life well lived, a life that's reached its promise. Okay, so that's after the end. Thank you. Questions. Ask a question, get a CD. What do you, how do you want to do it? Or you want a riddle? Ask a question, get a CD. <laughs> Can I get a CD? <laughs> Cadul. That was great. That was great. That was, but that was awesome. Yes. By the way, these two cheated on the opening thing. They talk to each other. I know they know each other. But, uh, uh, yes. No, no. Are you me? Yeah, for sure. Oh, okay. Let's do, so do you want the CD also? Yeah, no. <laughs> you can buy them, by the way. No, I didn't say that. My name is Nina. Hi. Hi. Um, so, are you afraid of death? On some days. On some days, I am. Yes. More peeing in an open space, though. Uh, it's 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 because it's years of living. It's a it's a it's. It's an you have to go through an unraveling, and the unraveling comes back and forth many, many times in your life. It, it, life isn't like a, a, a process that something happens and you don't go, you don't go back. It's, it's, it's an, a constant going back, and, going back and forth thing. That, that's why I studied math for seven years. Okay, math is built on logic. Logic is a lie. I, this, is what you, this is what you have to wake up and realize one day. These things that we believe, 
that we've laid on the world and this is the way the world works is not actually the way the world works, to just the way that we can express the way the world works to the best of our ability. So there's no straight line. There's no, there not, it doesn't work this way. There's realization, there's coming back, there's more realization, there's coming back. There are realizations that will change your life forever and you'll never come back from them. But the, everything in life is a process. So the letting go, the being able to be completely not defined, really learning what it is that a person really is, what are you really? If you're not your personality, if you're not your body, if you're not your thoughts, what are you really? This is a, a long, this is a process. And you know, kidai lachem, kidai lach, kidai lakulam, because it's an important one, because you have to shed the fat in your life. You, have to, you can't walk around your whole life thinking money is real. You'll just suffer from that, you know, but when it's not real, but, but you understand that maybe it's got to be used now and again, it's a, it's a, different, it's a whole different ballgame. So you, you have to just not be so entangled in the illusions of life, right? Countries, borders, all, all of these things were made up at some point in time, and we just, we just keep, keep with it, keep with it, keep with it. Same with your personality. Yes? Hi, my name is Asaf. Naimo Asaf. And you have children. At three. Um, don't you afraid to raise them without the fear of death? No. I'm, a, I'm afraid to raise them that they don't understand consequences. That I, w that I wouldn't want to do. But, but death, it's okay. Death, death is a different beast. I mean, whereas, you know, uh, if they die because they didn't understand the consequence of what they were doing, I w that would somehow be me, right? So that, that's why I got that, that kind of fear. But I don't live in, in constant fear. Yes? Uh, I'll ask a provocative question. Okay, please. Does death exist? Uh, so so uh, let me tell you, from my perspective, life doesn't exist. <laughs> the, that's, the way, that's the way I feel about it. And, and even mathematically, okay, life lasts 70 to 100 years. Death is forever. You want to tell me that life is the real one out of those two choices? Because I, I wouldn't, I, that's not the one I would take in those uh, circumstances. <laughs> So for me, life is, is the lie. Yes. Really? But I'm having so much fun. I got a microphone. I'm up on a stage. Oh, last question. That gets a CD. Then you fight for it. Death is not, it's, it's not something to be afraid of. And we're here living, living life. What's life about? Why are we here? So again, when you go through the process of the peeling, and you, under, you learn to understand, and you learn to understand the reality of death beyond our belief structures and, and beyond what we want it to be. Because like a motivational speaker would come out here and he would tell you, you're gonna die. And because you're gonna die, you should do everything you can today. And then we come with our belief system and we say, yeah, but life is everlasting. We have a soul, it's gonna keep going on. So we could still be lazy and it's fine, okay? That's like our loophole. But you have to first understand life and death to know what the meaning of it is. It's not like, here's the meaning and that's what it is. Life and death have the same meaning. There's no, there's no real change in the air once the balloon pops from it being in the balloon to it being in the collective, except that now it's in the collective and before it was locked in a balloon. That's the only real difference. Its purpose is still the same. So just because you die doesn't mean your purpose changes. Anyone else? Yes. I do not believe in free will, no. Wow. It's a fallacy. Um, the universe exists for, I mean, just like, I'll just throw off a few things, okay? The universe exists for a very, very long time. It wants a lot of things, okay? The way it gets what it wants is, is by what we, us, we want to do it, okay? There's no real free will that, do you know how in the world discoveries tend to happen simultaneously. This guy figures something out at the same time that that guy figures it out and suddenly a day later that guy figured it out without knowing that this guy figured it out and that guy figured it out and it's something that's never been figured out before. It, it, it happens for a reason. It's because it's not their will. It's where the world is. It's, what, it's the next step in the world and they're all, just, they're all just there to take it. Okay, when you want to build a house, when you, you know, if you don't build it, someone else will come along and build it. Okay, this happens all the time. So, 
I don't believe in free will. I believe that there's a will and that we take up that will from time to time. And we might think it's ours, but if we were tapped into the collective in the way that old s s tribal cultures were, let's say, you would see, like, uh, once you were expressing a will, some, someone was, is expressing that will also. That it ha it's happening all around you at the same time. So you could call it yours, but it's, a, it's kind of a limited look at, at what it is. Yes, sir? So, I disagree with you. I, Great. I Love it. Tell my, I, tell my kids I wouldn't tell my kids there's no such thing as free will. I disagree. Free will is all about making choices. No. And if you're going to raise your kids, and if you're going to raise your kids to choose between doing the right thing, being a bench, helping other people, being a jerk, being a bully, you're going to, if you're not going to share with them the insight that you're going to have to think about stuff, you're going to have to make choices in your life. That's different, than, that's different than free will. It's different than free will. Choice, yes. I didn't say you don't have a choices. You have choices. Not, not necessarily. Because it depends the scope of your choices. It depends how, it's like a mouse in a maze is gonna get to the food eventually. It has a few choices along the way which way it could go to get there. The will is getting the food. The choices it makes along the way dictate how, what you're saying. Is it a good mouse, is it an evil mouse? The choices it makes along the way to fulfill its will of getting the food you have, okay? But your will of being this, accomplishing this, discovering that, that, that's not yours, okay? But the choices you make along the way to get there, I'm willing to give you. And I teach my kids the same thing. I don't sit my kids down and say, nothing you do matters, okay? Yes, we all have choices along the way. But the choices are just how you're trying to fulfill your will. Okay, are you a good person trying to fulfill your will? Will you step on people trying to do it? Or will you not? That's a different question, and that's a choice, and you do have those. So I agree with you on that. Yes? Uh, I'd like to know which... Oh, sorry, which, yes. Which one book has influenced you the most? Wow, there's no one. There's no one. I'll give you a recent one. I'll give you a nice recent one, okay? There's a book called I Am That... By, uh, by, it's a book of conversations from, from uh, Sri Nisragadatta Maharaj is his name. The book is called I Am That, and it's people that came to him and asked him questions, and he answered them, and it's super. Yeah, there was a, yes, I'm sorry. This is not my question first, but you've heard of Vin Skelso, the radio host? Yes. You like him? Uh, yes. Great, thank you. My question is this. <laughs> Granted that death is longer as far as we know, and as far as hopefully. As far as we know, yes. It's longer than life. But you also speak about the collective. What collective could there be if people did not live at a length of time and do things? And well, so, and related to that, okay. would you agree with the following statement? Do you feel that, however you interpret it, even if it's homiletic, that people could live an entire lifetime in an hour, in a day, in a week? Is there such a thing like that? In which case, does the amount of time really matter? Or is it more about the moment and what it contributes during and after? Okay, so working backwards. There are flies that live a full, just one day. Okay, in that day, do they live a full life? Do they grow from childhood to adulthood? Do they have sex? Do they eat? Do they do all of those things? Yes, they do. The difference is they live at a different speed than us. Whatever, whatever you could say whatever speed you live at kind of dictates the amount of time you're here, right? If you and me each have 100 years, but I'm running around all the time and using it up fast, and you're mellow and using it up slow, you might live 110 and I might live 90, even though we experience the same 100 years. So the experience of time is what you're talking about, and the experience of time is different for everybody. And you could live in a week, if, if you could be that fast, you could definitely accomplish things in a week that we accomplish in 100 years, and creatures do, like I just said. You know, a dog lives a full life in 15, 20 years. Okay, so the time, it's like, it's kind of like metabolism versus the time that you have, you know, however fast your body moves, however fast you do things. This is kind of a, I've seen it, I've seen a, in, a, 
let's say a spiritual treatises, okay? They'll say your life is a is is this strand of this line right here, okay? Now, if you are emotionally and in your life you live like this, then you do this to that line and that line from left to right is now shorter. It's the same line and you've lived the same amount, but in year count, you've lived shorter because you've lived those years so up and down. But if you live that without going on the roller coaster, you'll get your full amount of time. Okay, so that's one way, one way to look at that. The overall time doesn't, is not really the relevant issue. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, you've died, but did you really live, man? You know, it's always that kind of thing. And then, uh, okay, and then the, the collective. So you asked the question, what is the collective if there is no life? Well, I didn't phrase it that way, but you're, you're promoting the collective. And yes. And we need to contribute to the collective during... I, I didn't say you need to. I said if you don't want to be afraid, okay? If you want to treat death as it is, okay? And wait, I just had something in my head that slipped my mind. Uh, blue, 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 blue. Um, oh, no, I lost it. It's gone. So <laughs> it happens. Um, so you asked if how if they're without life, what's the collective? Okay, again, but you're putting some words, you're, you're putting interpretations into what I said, and which is fine, but they're just not my same interpretations, okay? That's why it's like, you kind of got to go home and, and struggle with, with some things a, a little bit. And, and, and truthfully, everything we are gets sucked into some kind of collective once we die, whether it's your body being eaten and then and going out in, into the earth, and whether it's your air going up into, uh, into the atmosphere and being shared. There's no part of you that like stays where it is. And now I remember what I wanted to say. Descartes, okay, Descartes' famous line is I think therefore I am, okay? Very smart guy, but he's wrong about this. The truth is I share therefore I am, okay? The difference between a living thing and a dead thing is that a living thing must share. A living thing must breathe in and out. It must eat, it must, it has, a living thing must always share. The moment a living thing stops sharing is the moment of its death. So sharing is, is what life is, and not sharing is what death is. So the moment you stop sharing is the moment you die. Now, in a sense, when the individual is not individually sharing, the, the parts of that individual are staying, still being shared, okay? So it's a very fine line. Yeah, I didn't talk about your consciousness at all in this talk, and, and it, deserves, it deserves a place in this talk, okay? But it's something very personal because in order to understand that stuff, you really need to understand what a human being is. And that's a different talk. Okay, what is a human being really if he's not his skin and his bones? Okay, and consciousness could come into that in a, in, in a very real way. But it's something that it has to be personally explored beyond this moment. Yes. Okay, last question. Yes, go, I, yeah, I'm looking at you with the glasses right here. Didn't you just raise your hand? Didn't, yeah, yeah, didn't you? God. Yeah. Um, you started the talk uh, by talking about um, how you explain death to your children is like uh, the body stops working. The body working. stops working. So They're a, young, you know. There's a modern idea that I think is trending, or I just happen to find it very interesting. Let's trend it right now. Hashtag, uh, okay, sorry. Of, uh, seeing death as just being another disease, so seeing it as like something that is just the body malfunctioning. And there's an idea of like if we can keep it working, then like we treat it like a disease, we research it like a disease. Uh, can we cure it like a disease? Uh, so the question to you, I guess, is... Can I say one thing? That's, that's, am I allowed to use this word? That's fucked up. Can I say that? No. It's, look, death is not a disease. I mean, that's the thing. You know, the, everything in the world goes from like being an individual to being a collective to being an individual to being a collective. It's, it happens to everything. You know, it, to, to call death a disease is... It, it's, it's misguided because, first of all, you'll treat dying people very unfortunately. And second of all, dying people will suffer a lot more just in their head because they're dying of a disease. But, but is, is getting old a disease? Are you gonna stop me from turning 50 in a year and a half? I, I, don't, I don't see how that's gonna happen. If you tell me how that's gonna happen, they say, I've heard it said, if you, we live another 20, 30 years, we're gonna live two to 300 years because we, we're gonna start getting bio parts and gene alterations and all of this stuff and we'll live a longer life. 
does it mean anything to mankind that will live a longer life? I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it does. But it really depends on the consciousness of mankind. When, is, when will the consciousness of mankind learn its collective state, not just its individual state? Right? Because it's very, it's very, a small community is very easy. A community like this, a small community is very easy. But this isn't the only community you're a part of. We good? Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure.